Hello, everyone. Welcome. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us. I'm going to hold on for a few seconds while our platform is letting everyone in. In the meantime, I see our numbers growing. Feel free to go into our chat, give us a greeting, and let us know where you're tuning in from today. We would love to hear from you while we're giving it just a minute here. Welcome, welcome. Great to see everyone. I'm gonna give it a few more seconds while our platform is letting everyone in. While you're waiting, you can say hello, give us a greeting in the chat and let us know where you're coming in from today. I love seeing those. Hello, everyone. Wonderful. Awesome. Well, we're going to get started here today because we have a lot to go through. Welcome, everyone. Thanks for joining us and our webinar, Back to Basics Impact of Culture on Mental Health Conversations. My name is Jackie Zimmerman. I'm the Public Education Associate at Mental Health America's National Office, and I will be moderating today's panel. Just a few notes before I introduce our presenters. This webinar is being recorded and will be emailed out to all registrants within the week. We currently don't offer CEUs, but if you'd like a certificate of attendance, you can request one of those. In just a few minutes here, I'll post the link to that request in the chat, and it will also come in the follow-up email along with the video recording. Please feel free to add any comments, share any knowledge you might have in the chat with us today. We always love to hear your feedback. You can also post any questions you might have in there. Um, we do have a busy schedule, like I said today, so we may or may not get to those additional questions, but please post them so if we do have some time, we can go over things that you all are wanting to hear more about. So now I'm so excited to welcome today's panelists. Crystal, Graciela, and Liz. I'm going to give you a little bit of background about each of them before we start. Crystal is the vice chair of the Asian Mental Health Collective, a nonprofit organization which aspires to make mental health easily available, approachable, and accessible to Asian communities worldwide. A proud second generation Filipino American, Crystal's mental health advocacy and nonprofit leadership extends to her work as fellowship director for the Filipino Young Leaders Program and coach for the National Federation of Filipino American Associations, empowering Filipino youth through collaboration program. Crystal served as an ambassador for the White House Initiative on Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders during the Obama administration, steering committee member for the National Network to Eliminate Disparities in Behavioral Health, and a health equity ambassador for the American Psychological Association. Welcome, Crystal. We also have with us Graciela, who began their career supporting grassroots organizations in the South and became passionate about sex education through their past work with queer youth around HIV advocacy. Graciela is now the mental health training coordinator at BEAM, Black Emotional and Mental Health Collective, they are committed to developing coalition around building safe futures for queer folks and trans folks, specifically in the South, and addressing housing inequities among marginalized communities. Graciela is also passionate about being a student and a musician, as well as reading. They love to use music, art, and a do-it-yourself approach to deepen connections and promote understanding of movement work. Welcome, Graciela. And last, we have Liz. Liz is a licensed marriage and family therapist and co-owner at Psychosocial Therapy. She was born and raised in East Los Angeles to immigrant parents. Liz integrates brain spotting, expressive arts therapy, and indigenous healing traditions, especially dream work, in her practice. Liz specializes in women empowerment, our LGBTQ plus and BIPOC communities, and reframing vulnerability as a sign of strength. Welcome, Liz. Wow, we have such an accomplished group of individuals with us today. Um, so we will jump right into discussion. The first panel question that I would love to hear from you all about is, how was mental health talked about or not talked about for you growing up? And how has that evolved over time? And anyone who would like to start can go for it. 
Um, I can go first. I um, would love to just test out my um, audio. Uh, you'll see that my audio is one part, but my face is another. So I'm glad to that's connected. Um, my name is Crystal Canari. Um, I am from Philippines, having family that immigrated here. And once I immigrated here, you know, to answer the question just straight up, mental health. Looks like we might have lost Crystal. I know that she is dealing with some technology challenges today. So as she is able to participate, we're so grateful to have her here. But um, I saw across the yellow, you on mute. Did you want to share? Yeah, I can um, start. So um, thank you so much again for that introduction. And yeah, I'm so honored to be here in space with you all. Um, so my background, my father's black. Um, my family kind of comes from Southern Louisiana, but migrated to Chicago um, due to the Jim Crow um, South. Um, and then my mother is Mexican. Um, so they were migrant workers, um, kind of all up and down like the Midwest. And so I feel like a lot of my family, the way that mental health was like, I think it was showed in like so many different ways, but the language just wasn't there. Like, you know, making sure to like take care of ourselves and like my abuela letting us know, like, you know, make sure you do your hair and like do things that make you feel good. But we're able like to really talk about like mental health and like having access to that because my family just worked, you know, my mom worked from the time she was six and she's 60 now, you know, whether that was like picking fruit, picking, you know, vegetables, things like that. And then my, on my dad's side, um, kind of like, again, like working class, like poor welfare, things like that. So mental health wasn't really something that was like accessible um, for my family. But I think a lot of where my family is at now, um, just because like I'm now like working in mental health, doing a lot of things, you know, I see my mom taking me days is what she calls them. And, you know, they're not like what she doesn't understand, like, yeah, those are mental health days, you know, like due to like having a lot of grief that happened in my family through the pandemic and just like healthcare things, you know, um, I think she's realizing now because there's so much information about like what mental health is. And then also seeing like her Mika, like working in it now, you know, I'm just like, yeah, mom, you need those mental health days. You need to like take a step back. You've been working since you were five years old. Like what, you know? So I think it's um, really beautiful to see that evolve that's why I really appreciate this question like how it's evolved over time you know she also was in the military so I you know so much of her life has been centered around working and not taking that time to just like reset and just you know pause and do the things that she needs to do you know she's always like yeah therapy yeah I did that and I'm like no that's not something you just do you know like pick it back up and let's see what it is but I think it's just like me taking the time like talking with her about like, okay, what is coming up for you? Like, what are your feelings, you know, and just making sure to check in with her because she is, you know, technically an elder now. And I'm just like, you know, what's, what's going on and like, what's coming up. So um, I think now it's like something that she's actively like thinking about and also seeing me like go through therapy too. I've been in therapy for over five years now um, has really helped her to like shape her and to think about those things that she don't think she would have ever thought about before. <laughs> Yeah, um, Graciela, thank you. I, a lot of what you said definitely resonates with me. Um, I'm the, I am the first generation um, born and raised in this country. And um, my mom immigrated from Mexico, right? And um, I grew up in a very big family. Um, even in the, within our household, there was two bedrooms and there was like eight or nine of us. <laughs> You know, so we had folks sleeping in the living room, in the den, uh, you know, so it's just like, um, and I think that, again, like being working class, right, um, it's just like being trying to survive, basically, right? So when you're trying to survive and, and meet your basic needs, like shelter, 
um, food, healthcare. Back when I was growing up, it wasn't like mandatory for us to have healthcare. So I basically grew up without health insurance, not until I had my first like full-time job in my mid twenties, did I actually have healthcare where I didn't have to wait hours to see a doctor. I remember the first time I was like, I had Kaiser and I was like, oh, I waited like less than 10 minutes to see a doctor. And I had to remind myself, okay, Liz, this is what it's like to have health care, right? So when you're basic, you're just trying to meet your basic needs, the mental health is almost pushed to the side, right? But then again, it it's about education, about culture, and about access. So for me growing up, we didn't really talk about mental health besides things like, oh, she had an attack, a nervous break breakdown, basically, like, oh, tuvo un ataque de nervios. That's basically what the what we talked about mental health, but even then it was kind of seen as negative, right? Um, it wasn't like, uh, oh, you know, they're dealing with depression or, or anxiety, right? But basically that was it. Or like that person's crazy, you know, esa persona está loca, right? That person like, you know, they're crazy. Um, because whatever, because they're talking to themselves or because whatever might be going in that, on in that person's life. So that um, understanding really what mental health what is was not definitely not there back then, at least. But I think now my family has been growing and we've had some tragic deaths in my family, one including suicide, unfortunately, which was really hard on our family and I think now it's like because of that it's opened up but I think we our family my family still has a way to go but you know slowly right and you can't really for me it's like I can't really like you have to for me it's like I meet people where they're at you know I'm not gonna force them to see something or try to them to think something if they're not there yet you know the the beauty of this is that everything that I wanted to share, like I feel like Liz, Graciela, I was, you were being channeled in, in what I wanted to share as well. And so um, I wanted to actually share what Monique said in the chat, um, chat, immigrant parents are tasked with the job of survival and the first generation children are presented with the luxury of self-actualization. Uh, I, similar, I feel like to what you, uh, you two have been saying, my um, parents were the first ones to come here um, from the Philippines and as as a second generation Filipina with two immigrant parents working class work multi multiple jobs and then my grandparents raising me and they were ones that only spoke the Galog. I had to learn early on that their ways of expressing emotions was different from speaking it aloud that they were um, expressing their emotions and their love through doing and um, I'll be honest like the idea of self-actualization the idea of mental health um, wasn't on top of mind for them, like you all said, you know, they, they were trying to survive, like, from the Philippines, they, they left because of a dictator in the Philippines, and, and then they were also experiencing trauma through um, the impact of World War II in the Philippines, and so I had to understand, you know, as I was growing up, like, what that meant, and even to this day, trying to talk to them about mental health, and, and what that looks like by modeling the way, by, by expressing my emotions, and in the ways that I can. Um, I think one piece that I want to add around just how that evolved for me is that um, I didn't really think about mental health or just the idea of like people expressing emotions with one another until I saw it on TV, um, you know, Full House, Gilmore Girls, French Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, like the thing was, I didn't see myself in these TV shows, but I did see family units talking to one another. And so that's what I began to say, maybe I can share and express my, like who I am through through speaking up or through through different activities like um, like music like arts and so um, this evolved truly in college I learned what um, how to be more intentional about what I was believing in um, through my first college organization I was involved with a Filipino Cultural Association where for the first time in my life I saw people that looked like me and they were also trying to navigate life and and what it was like to be a Filipino um, when I didn't see people around me previous to that. And what ended up happening was we ended up holding space for one another. We ended up um, holding what we called Philippine cultural nights 
where we actually wrote plays and musicals about our identities as second generation philams. And I used that as my writing sample after college in order to become an intern at SAMHSA. Um, for those that don't know, SAMHSA is a substance abuse mental health services administration. People, um, it's a part of like the federal government. People often know CDC or FDA, but people don't often know SAMHSA. And when I got in, like involved in SAMHSA and in the world of just the mental health field, I then became one of few people um, in it and started to bring my parents out to those events. And from there, um, now my parents are asking me, like, I think so-and-so may be depressed. Like what, um, what are things that I can say? And, and it's been such a learning experience for my whole family and, and the communities that I'm in. Um, because we're all learning about it together. And, um, and like what um, people said earlier, you know, it, it's a learning process. We're still all um, doing it in, in what I think of is in Kapwa, um, in the Filipino community. Uh, there's a big value of like, I'm not me without you. We're all connected. And so um, I just want to say that on the front end, like this journey of, of learning about mental health evolved over time, not just by myself, but in, in community with others. Wonderful. Thank you all. That was so great to, to hear and to kick off our discussion. And I know a lot of people are connecting with you in the chat. I'm not sure if you're reading and seeing all of those, but it's just so appreciated, all of your responses. And our next question really coincides with our last one. And um, you may have more to add. You may not. That's okay. But um, what influence did culture specifically have on your mental health? or has had and continues to have? Yeah, I really um, appreciate everyone and how much they have been sharing. I think a lot of what my culture, like, like I said, coming up, like Black American, you know, Mexican, um, I guess I'm still trying to understand, but I guess I'm considered third generation, um, but, you know, so much of it was just working, you know, and then also having, like, both of my parents came from the military, so a lot of that showed up, you know, in our household, um, and also that intergenerational trauma, too, of, like, slavery, like, migrant working, and things like that, um, and I think a lot of what it taught me was like, I did want to break away from that. And I think that was like kind of my journey into mental health. Um, and also thinking about, not, I, you know, I'm kind of going to quote my CEO, Yolo Keely Robinson, when I say this, you know, something that they said in a um, session a couple weeks ago that really stuck with me. And I didn't even realize that this happened was that, you know, so much of Black families, when they're introduced to mental health, it's mandated by the state. And I had to realize, yeah, like due to like my parents, like, you know, having interpersonal violence um, or inter, inter partner violence, you know, I was mandated as a young person to go to therapy. And so for so many years, I totally forgot that was my first therapy session, you know, like the violence of the state and, you know, the prison industrial complex and realizing like how I associated that with mental health you know, with therapy. And then now like going into my journey into therapy outside of like state mandate, like how different those sessions were versus now and how that really shows up um, and didn't even realizing how much that showed up for my clients too. Like when I'm talking with my clients, they're like, oh no, that's for white people. We don't do therapy, you know, we don't do this or we don't do that because, you know, a lot of times my clients, the first time that they entered a therapy session was because the state mandate them to do so and you know on this side of things realizing that like yeah like those case managers probably have 80 90 maybe 100 people on their caseload they're just busting people out so they don't have that time to build that rapport with people or to like really get into their stories they're just doing what they need to do get that paperwork done and on to the next you know um and so i think so much of that shows up um in like having to remember that that shows up so much in my clients' lives and having to like let them know my own journey and be like, you know, like I've been in therapy. This is like my um, way that I've done it. And, you know, therapy doesn't have to look that way. Um, and so I think so much of that comes up for me when I'm thinking about like mental health. Thank you, Graciela. 
that comes up for me when I think of um, my culture is both positive, positive and negatives. And, and what I think about that is like, because I was surrounded by family and, and later on community, um, and I, I was able to better understand what my identity meant to me, it had positive enforces, uh, reinforcements in, in how I was confident in myself and how I believed in myself. At the same time, when I didn't have that, um, specifically thinking about Philippines and it being colonized by many different forces over time, I, I had to really think about what, uh, what an author, um, Dr. E.J. David calls like brown skin, white minds. What does that look like being the little brown brother of the U.S. after being colonized by the United States and being, um, and then even Spain, the colonization and, and um, enforcement of Catholicism into Filipino culture. It, it, it really impacted me in trying to really think about like how have those impact those those factors impacted the way I think about myself, you know, and over time had to really decolonize and understand like what anti-blackness looks like in the Filipino community. What why why was my why were my parents asking me about like um, the use of skin whitening products in order for me to be like prettier than than um, somebody that was darker skinned or what were the things that made it such that you know, I'll, I'll say it like one time I, I called an organization um, out for cultural appropriation for using a Filipino word. And instead of people asking about why I did that, they they went to the individuals and, and apologized for my behavior and that we should be grateful that white men are calling uh, an institution after a Filipino name, you know, and um, those are just certain examples where culture, the, like me understanding my culture and me doing that shadow work of understanding who I am and, and what does pre-colonial Philippines look like um, has impacted the way I see myself and how I see myself navigating this world. And um, I, I really have learned to, one, share my story, one, because I often don't see it, um, but to um, know that there are other people also doing that type of work and knowing that um, to be in Kapwa, like I said, to be in, in connection with what other people um, really requires that that um, navigation of your mind, body, and spirit, uh, and being intentional with um, things that are even beyond Western um, healing practices, like and and trying to do that work of understanding and learning from those before me um, ancestrally and those that are from the land to understand how um, how I can can find that calling again, if that makes sense. Um, and and it's still a journey for me. Um, past year, um, got connected to uh, somebody that is considered a bylaw and marcher, and they are individuals that, again, uh, based in pre colonial Filipino medicines and understanding what that type of healing looks like, then we go into talk therapy. And so, um, I would say, in aspects of the question, I am impacted by my culture in various different ways and that it's, it's ever growing um, as I continue to, to learn more about it. Thank you, Crystal. Yeah, so much, uh, so much wisdom that has been spoken. Um, right now by Graciela and um, Crystal. Thank, thank you, both of you. Uh, so much comes up for me. I'm all, wait, how much time we got here? <laughs> I'm all, oh, yes to that. Yes, 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 yes. yes. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, so when I think about culture and uh, mental health, I think about um, los cargos y regalos, um, las cargas y regalos, right? The burdens and the gifts right? Um, because it's not all like peachy great, but it's not always, you know, all of the heavy work and like the shadow work, like one of my compañeras just talked about, right? And as far as like the shadow work, you know, you know, Crystal, you named like, um, you know, co colonization, right? That has a huge impact on the Turtle Island, right? On the Americas and how we view ourselves, right? Um, talking about colorism, 
right? Talking about anti-Blackness as well, homophobia, transphobia, right? Um, racism, classism, um, ableism, all the isms, right? And how that just seeps into our culture and how that impacts how we view ourselves and how we treat others even within our own families, right? And, you know, um, how that affects our self-esteem, our sense of worth, our sense of what we're able to achieve or what we think we can and cannot achieve or what we're capable of, you know, the stories and the narratives that are created around that, right? Um, so those are, um, yeah, that's one of the things I think about as far as the burdens, and as far as the gifts, for me, growing up, um, I always uh, was really curious about my indigenous side of um, my family and my roots and started in really young age and as a teenager, picking up books, going in the um, library and, you know, finding books, stumbling upon them and learning about my culture, which I really loved. And then later on, um, as a young adult, really diving into the spirituality and, um, you know, uh, setting up altares for my ancestors, for Day of the Dead, right, for animas, um, going to ceremonies and knowing that, like, we can also heal as a community, right, being in prayer, um, giving thanks to the elements, giving thanks to Mother Earth, to Pachamama, to Tonantzin, right? And knowing that we are, at the end of the day, we are all connected, right? And nature is part of us and we are part of nature. And how do we find that balance and how do we give respect and give thanks? Um, so that's what I think about as far as like um, the gifts and the burdens about um, mental health and culture. Wonderful, beautifully said. The next question I have for you all is, have you witnessed stigma play a role in how communities view or discuss mental health? And what effect does that stigma have on finding or receiving care? Yeah, I wanna piggyback off of something that Liz was, Liz and Crystal were talking about just about how much like colonization, the state, um, so many things that were mandated um, by, you know, just like so much violence, like really took away like a lot of that language to describe like what was coming, what's coming up for us, like what was happening, you know, in our families. A lot for me anyways, you know, we have family members that were diagnosed and living with bipolar disorder, you know, anxiety, depression, like all these things. And I know that as a young person, like when I was witnessing these things, you know, whether it was like an outburst or seeing like that violence, you know, it left me feeling like scared and, you know, having so many questions that weren't answered um, because we just moved on to the next thing. Like, it was like, okay, that happened. Anyways, we're cleaning up this mess and we're going on to the next thing. Like, we're not going to talk about it. We're not going to um, acknowledge it. It's just like this huge act of violence just happened and we're moving on, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. um, because that's just like how life is. That's how men act. That's how boys act, you know, like in my family, the women were, I would consider to be like the strong ones. They were the head of the family they were the disciplinary they were carrying out all the duties as what like a dad would do and a mom would do you know but dad was just like or the the masculine person was just able to kind of like come and do whatever they you know wanted to do and so I think it was um, also like super frustrating and that's when I think I really did tap into like pushing back like you know definitely in my older years being like okay but this isn't okay like you know like they're not allowed to just like act out and do all the things and then I'm supposed to just take that you know absolutely not <laughs> and so like having like push back against like my theas you know when my like Theo like is able to like talk to them all kind of wild up and down I'm just like no like he cannot talk to you like that or you know having to like you know me and my father we still working through stuff you know um he's being more receptive now that I'm older but having to like let him know like what was coming up for me and what I was navigating as a young person um and so I think now what most importantly, I have to remember, you know, when I come into those things, like as a practitioner, like being in space with, um, 
with my clients, when they exhibit those behaviors, you know, those things still come up for me, that vicarious trauma still shows up for me and having to remember to do that aftercare for myself too, you know, after I witness those things, like with, whether that's like with my clients or with like community members or just like living, you know, in the world, because just because we clock out don't mean, you know, when we go into the world that we can't stop being service workers, you know, like I feel if you're really committed to that work, it still shows up for you when you're in everyday life. And so having to do that aftercare is something that I have to remind myself over and over again, whether that's doing a mask, whether that's reading, going outside, journaling, you know, doing those things, because it's it's one thing to view it and to discuss it, you know, like seeing those things, but then what does that after look like, you know? Um, so I, that was a lot that was coming up for me when um, you were saying that question. Yeah, that is such a great reminder. Thank you, Graciela. And it brings us back to, to this whole topic in this series of back to basics and what it really means to take care of our mental health. You know, post pandemic, we saw all of these increased mental health concerns, but also increased discussion. But really, what does mental health mean and how do we care for it? And you just did such a great job of you know, recognizing how you as a professional are taking care of it, but then those basics of remembering, you know, I need to take care of myself and what does that mean and look like within my personal and professional life. So thank you. Any other thoughts on this question? And thank you all in the chat for these wonderful comments. Um, the question was around stigma, right? And mental health. Yeah. Yeah. One of the things that I think about is how important language is. And um, when talking about someone um, using person first language, right? So basically what person first language is, um, exactly that, putting the person first, right? And um, for example, instead of saying like a person with di um, diabetes, right? You could say, um, well, I'm sorry. Instead of saying like that person's a diabetic, right? Cause you're saying that that's who they are. You're basically separating um, the diabetes from the person. So then you're saying that's a person with diabetes. Right. So it's the same thing, for example, with mental health. So instead of saying like um, that's schizophrenic or that's a person that's schizophrenic, you know, um, is schizophrenic, you'd say a person with schizophrenia. Right. So um, because what happens is that you're reinforcing that trait and that person that they're bad or inferior. Right. When you don't use person first um, language. And we're also reinforcing permanency, saying that that person will always be like that, right? Um, which can also lead to discrimination as well too. So just being conscious as well, um, as far as our language and, and how we speak about people, I think is really important. Thank you. Absolutely, Liz. I wanted to add, you know, there's a lot coming up for me too in, in this question. And it, it, I think about, and I don't know if there were trigger warnings in the beginning, but I will be talking about suicide, like the idea of suicide and, and people saying that it is, a, you know, someone committed suicide instead using someone died by suicide, you know, someone taking their life is not a crime. And, and so being very intentional with language and, and also, you know, when someone is experiencing mental health challenges, um, May, um, making sure not to 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 bully stereotype or or other other these other um, individuals. I feel like um, I'll speak from my experience being in in like the Filipino community and specifically in my family. It's such it's I, I, we've said it already, but I'll say it again. Like when someone is dealing with challenges they don't want to talk about it. Like it, if, if someone is dealing with a challenge, then it's like, don't, don't let that get out of the bag. Like don't get, say this outside of the family or um, like one time and it was recent, there was an individual in my family that had a suicide attempt, unfortunately. And, um, and when we were trying to get them help, uh, they were 
I, I asked, like, I was like, we, we need to find more professional help. And um, it was like, once that act was done there, um, they were like, oh no, they'll be fine. Or like, like they, they don't need to go anywhere else. Like we're here. And, and, and just that idea of, of trying to reduce the stigma. Like this is mental health is just as important as physical health. Mental health is health. Like there aren't like things that require um, additional support outside of family, outside of religion, et cetera, et cetera, um, should be taken into consideration. And so, um, yeah, that's what I have to say about it. I, there's more to say, but I'll just say that for, for the meantime. Um, Crystal, you know, you also um, reminded me of something else when we're talking about stigma and um, there's so much shame. There is so, shame can be so paralyzing to some people, right? Especially when we're talking about like intergenerational trauma on top of like our own trauma and then community trauma, right? It's just like layered on top of layer to layers, layers, right? So shame can be so, so paralyzing, right? And it's like, no, we don't talk about that, you know, in, right? Like, no, no, not let's not talk about that. And to me, I see like shame, like the pink elephant in the room, like everybody knows it's there, but we want to avoid it and not talk about it. And I think that by helping break mental health stigma is exactly that we need to share our stories and we need to be vulnerable and see that when we are vulnerable right that means that we're strong not that we're weak right because we're taking a chance right our tears are running down our face and a lot of the times especially as women I see we apologize many times, right? Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, right? Because of your tears. And tears are a gift. That's how I see them. Let your tears water the earth, you know? Um, yes, and the more that we talk about it, then, you know, it gets just a little bit, a little tiny bit easier. And a little, and then you never know. We don't know what our words or our presence or what we say, how we impact people, right? Because we can't be in, each other's minds right so when you never know when you speak up or when you say something you might be inspiring somebody whether it be a family member or a friend or maybe somebody just walking down the street that they just so they heard you say something and that triggered something in them triggered in a good sense right <laughs> right in their mind that inspired them like oh yeah like I I need to do this or I want to talk about this right so yeah, again, like sharing our stories, I think really helps um, heal our communities as well, too. Yes, and I just, I have to recircle and just like uplift something you're saying, Liz, that like, you know, I know witnessing and also like speaking for myself, like we do carry so much of that trauma, that intergenerational trauma from our grandmas, for our great grandparents, from our ancestors, our transcestors, you know, and if you really like tap in and like pay attention to your clients or to the people that you work with, you can see that, you can see that in our faces and our sighs and our cries, like you were talking about, and we have to be mindful of that, like sometimes, you know, it is hard to just like have clients like show up to an appointment, you know, because of whatever might have happened the night before or what have, might have happened like at a different point um, or what that doctor's office can mean for them. Like so many things like show up and so, so much of our lives have been just like so much violence in it, you know? But like you said, like there's still the, the beautiful thing that you said, you know, we have the gifts, you know? And we also still have that bag. It's like hand in hand. We still find our ways to like have a fun time with the little things that we have, you know? Um, but at the same time, it's just like realizing that, yeah, we're caring so much. And so being able to like be like, how important it is to, yeah, tell our stories, like tell what's coming up and being able to share with my clients or with my mother or with my people, you know, that's peer support, you know, that's what we talk about at Beam so much and how important it is to like share community with each other and not just in these like 
you know, like sad spaces, but also like enjoy, like, what are we doing to like have fun, you know, like how are we sharing space together? You know, what are we doing as like a community or, you know, even in our workspaces, like how can we go and like get to know each other? Because that's how we're able to know, like, you know what, I'm struggling right now. I just don't have it, you know? So how can you support me? Like, how can we support each other? Because it's not just like doing the work, but then we can't do the work. And I like to quote Lauren Hill when I say, this we can't win if we ain't right within you know like we're not we're not gonna have liberation in our lifetime or manifest any of those things if you not taking care of yourself like you can't do nothing because you just spread harm all over the place <laughs> you know like you might have to tell your coworker, please go take a break please go on vacation because that's gonna help all of us you know <laughs> I was just listening to Lauren Hill earlier today <laughs> Thank you all. I, I, there were so many great parts of that, but one thing that's really standing out to me is the importance of having conversations with others and talking about our mental health and how do we do that, you know, to, to bring up the things that are going well and maybe the challenges and having all of those conversations. So how would you all suggest that we encourage more of those supportive, honest, and intentional conversations about our mental health with those around us? I think the thing that pops up to mind for me is by modeling the way, you know, um, that it's okay not to feel happy, confident, energized 100% of the time. And um, for me, I make the point to be honest about how I'm feeling with whoever I interact with and to embrace all the feelings that I'm feeling and to say it aloud. Um, you know, when people ask me, how are you? I have really stopped saying I'm fine when I'm not because um, <laughs> half the time it is, I'm not fine. And um, I've, I've had to train myself to say, like, when I say I'm fine, it often means like feelings I'm not expressing. Like what's another emotion on that emotion wheel that I think of in my head that I can say instead of I'm fine. And by doing that, by, by with me and my, um, and the sessions I have with, with my fellows or in the community, we often also start with um, a check-in, like a, a mind, body, spirit check-in where we ask on the front end before any business, any agenda items, like, like, um, how's your mind, body, and spirit? And we, we go through that because it's important um, to have that open conversation. And yeah, I, I, I would say that for, for me, just being honest with yourself and modeling that way. And then others around you, I'm sure, will, will build that same culture of, of that honesty and openness. Definitely. Thank you, Crystal. Uh, Crystal, I just don't want to add, but I really don't like those pleasantries of like, hey, how are you doing? And oh, I'm good. How are you? Oh, I'm good too. It's like, no, how are you really feeling today? Did you have your cup of coffee? <laughs> you know, because it's like, yeah, it's just like, well, I'm not feeling good. Do you really want to know? If you really don't want to know, then don't ask me. <laughs> Um, but one of the things that um, comes up for me as far as talking about, uh, you know, the mental health aspect is also like when I think for and even for myself too, it's a reminder is like when I have something that, that's heavy on me, on my chest or on my mind, right, or my shoulders, when I'm going to approach somebody like a friend or a loved one asking them, hey, um, you know what, I really need to talk about something. Do you have capacity to talk about it? Right. Because then what happens sometimes is like un unconsciously, sometimes we kind of just like dump onto our loved ones or, you know, the, our friends. And we don't know if they have capacity. Maybe they had a really hard day that day and they just don't have capacity in that moment, you know. And it's not necessarily a bad or a good thing, right? It's just, it just is what it is. And I think it's uh, also practicing um, the word, uh, what's the word? Ah, it's right on the tip of my tongue. Um, consent, right? Practicing consent. 
um, I think is really important as well too when needing to talk about some of some of the things that might be on our minds that we want to talk with folks about. Thank you, Liz. Any other thoughts on this question? Okay. We can go on to our, our next topic, um, which how do you see the connection between culture and community playing a role in improving the mental health of those you work with or um, your personal experiences of people around you? Yeah, I'll say that a lot of what I see now is just so many people in our community carving out spaces for ourselves. And I think it's so important because, you know, in no nonprofit industrial complexes, you know, like you have folks that are sitting around the table like, okay, so how can we get into this community? What can we do? You know, how can we do that? Instead of like hiring folks from the that community, bringing them into this space, it's like, how can we, you know, basically colonize how, let me call it what it is. How can we go into this community, you know? And so now I feel like the beautiful thing is our communities are starting to take care of ourselves now and doing it our way, being able to connect, you know, using our languages, you know, seeing pamphlets in different languages, seeing spaces in different languages, building altars at the beginning of a meeting, you know, doing like all of the things that our ancestors already did, you know, and like have already built like those. And I see that coming up in so many places and seeing so many different modalities like show up. And I think it's so important um, to see that and to incorporate that into our work and not be afraid to do that because you just, you don't even know how you can touch, you know, other communities or be able to have like queer, like Latinx folks or queer, like Creole folks and like how they're able to like share, you know, that connection. And for me, for someone, I, I am Black and Mexican, but I didn't come from um, at a, as a young person, I didn't speak Spanish like in my home. So being able to connect with like other like Hispanic folks where that was like true for them, you know, but then also learning things about like other cultures, like whether that's like queerness, blackness, you know, and all that. Um, and just seeing like how creative like our communities are too. And um, how our young people are also talking and evolving this language around mental health as well. Like a lot of what you were, we were saying earlier, you know, my work is um, also with young people and using music um, as a space um, to see liberation. And I'm a, I don't know if y'all can see I'm a DJ. And so, you know, for me, I see the dance floor as a space to like reclaim and like have liberation and like using our bodies to take up space and you know me being a rapper Megan the Stallion that's my boo you know like how important women are like black women are like you know claiming our bodies in this time and being unapologetic about how we speak about our bodies and sex positivity and you know all these things but also drag queens taught me how to DJ so like you know, like paying homage to like tra our transcestors and our trans women, how they're also building community. Um, so I think it's so important um, to highlight that and to like bring that up that our communities are creating our spaces. And it, and not, that's also something that's not new, you know, too. This is what we've always been doing. But like, mm -hmm. I also want to uplift that, you know, my, my CEO always says this all the time. There's no way that when the slaves were coming like during the Atlantic slave trade that they weren't peer supporting each other, figuring ways to support each other, you know? And that like hits me so deep to think about that. Like, you know, we had church, you know, that was the only place where black folks were able to conjugate, you know, was in, through service, you know? Um, and so, yeah, that's, that's a lot of like what was coming up for me when I was thinking about that. I want to riff off that, Graciela. I'm thinking of my colleague, her name is Dawn. She's from Navajo Nation. Um, her response to this question of like, how do you know something's evidence-based? Well, we're still here and we're like, we're still owning our healing and, and our journeys and all that we do. And so for Dawn, I don't know, she's probably not on this, but I just want to uplift her. Um, we'll do a shout out to the Asian Mental Health Collective. Um, I serve on the board of the organization and, you know, I haven't been in it as long as our founders have, but imagine like pre-pandemic 
2018, 2019, a Facebook group called Settled Asian Mental Health was created. And now 2022, over 60,000 people are on this group sharing how they are feeling, being peer supports to one another. Um, we now have a Facebook group called Asian Mental Health Professionals that is helping individuals that are identify as Asian um, really help them get through like whatever mental health professional um, pipeline they want to be in, help them learn how to support one another, receive funding to, to do the work that they're doing, et cetera, et cetera. And all this, you know, has always been done, but it's just becoming, it's ramping up even more and more that we're leaning into our culture. We're getting, finally getting funding to do the work that we want to do. Um, my, me, myself, I, and I did, it's not in my bio, but I'm actually in my first week of a new job that is actually melding the API mental health together. I've always worked in the mental health field, but now I'm serving as the policy director for the National API Mental Health Association so that we can now advocate for policies to better support the needs and access of Asian American Pacific Islanders. And so I just want to double down on what you said, Graciela. We are figuring it out. We are leaning into our culture and our communities to do this work. And um, just really, I feel like it's just divine that I'm on this panel today, knowing, knowing like all these things have been coming to fruition for me specifically in these past few months of me saying, I want to be able to support my community directly through this type of work. So I'm just honored to be on this panel and, and just energized by all the things that are being said right now. Thank you, Crystal and Graciela. You're all, are we all fire, okay? <laughs> I'm just like, yes, 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 yes. <laughs> you know, I, and I think about healing, right? And when, we, when we're talking about intergenerational trauma, right? It's like, oh, it's in our DNA, it's passed down. I'm like, yes, but so is healing, right? Our bodies know how to heal, but sometimes we stop that process, whether consciously or unconsciously, right? And because we have inherited DNA from my ancestors, our ancestors also know how to heal, right? As well too. And the whole evidence-based stuff, it's like, you know, um, indigenous medicine, indigenous wisdom is scientific. And then we have all these like Western scientists trying to um, be like, oh, we wanna need to prove this. It's like, no, fool. This has been our medicine. We've had this for centuries. And now you want to come and tell us that it's okay for us to use our own medicine. We've been using it for centuries. We don't need your okay. You know what I'm saying? It's like, mm -mm, mm -mm. our people, we know how to heal. Our communities, we know how to heal. It is in our blood. Is it in our bones? It is in our dreams. It is in our DNA, right? We know how to heal our communities. We know how to heal. We know how to heal through music, through dance, through food, you know, through spending time together, through hugging, through crying, right? We, we know how to heal. We, we got this. We got this. We just sometimes need to remind each other, right? And be in that joy, be in that love because we know how to do this. <laughs> thank you <laughs> that's it that's it right there that's it I just yes I mean I think it's so much of what you said too it just made me think you know just to be trans thinking about like my family like my abuela like I mean so much like we use the earth to heal ourselves too like you were talking about and I just remember even just as a young person like getting stung by a bee and my abuela was like Mija just put mud in it you know, just put mud, pick up the clay off the ground, put mud in it. And as soon as I put it on there, that sting went away. And I was like, how, how, <laughs> you know, it just, you know, we, we've had this, so we've, we've been doing this. So yeah, that, that's just what was coming up for me. <laughs> Thank you all. Um, I so appreciate that conversation. I know we're getting close to the hour, but I'd love to quickly get one more question in and um, just, just briefly answering, if there's someone watching right now or that's listening later and they're struggling with their mental health and, and do struggle with talking about it and having those conversations, what advice do you have for someone that doesn't know how to start that conversation or doesn't know where to turn to?
Yeah, I think one of the things that comes up for me is um, that you're not alone, right? I think many times uh, for many folks, it's like a lot of the times, I, I don't know if this is like human nature or we've been socialized. I'm not really sure, but it's like a lot of the times we feel like we're the only one going through something, right? And just to know that it's like you are not alone and also I know I, I think I, just, I think about the different layers of mental health right um but I would say to talk with someone that you trust first right talk with someone that you trust also to, and I also think about like accessibility right like where does this person live do what age are they how young are they you know are they in school right because if you're in school then maybe there's a social worker or you know a teacher or somebody that you feel like you can trust that you can speak to or a, a really good friend right um I also think about like you know if it's someone that you're thinking about like is therapy a good fit for me <clears throat> if you have health insurance you can talk with your doctor and ask for a referral for therapy as well um yeah, but I, I always think for my go-to is I like go to someone you trust first, right? It's really hard to talk about your feelings sometimes, something that you're struggling with. And, you know, it, it could be very lonely, right? It, I think it, it can be very lonely and just know that it's like you're not alone, right? And just talk with someone that, that you trust about it. And then um, seeing like... A, you know, how that person could get connected to services if that's what they want. Yeah, but those are the first things that come up for me. Um, Graciela or yeah. Crystal, anything else you'd like to add? Yeah, I think most importantly, I think is like, yes, listen to yourself. And something else that came to mind, I just read that I just read this amazing book um, by Octavia Rahim called Pause Recipe. And in the book, she talks about like the process of like how a caterpillar becomes a butterfly and how they have to go into this liminal space. And when they go into this space, they basically turn into goop, you know, they turn into like soup and they become imaginal cells where they become like unrecognizable. And then they turn into a butterfly, you know, they don't know what's going to turn into this, what's going to turn into that, but also realizing like, you know, we cannot be using the master's tools and quoting Audre Lorde to dismantle the, the master's house, you know, we have to reimagine like what that healing looks like, what worked yesterday might not work today, you know, um, and also remembering that when you're healing, like it's a journey and I, as many times as people have said that, like, it's a journey, not a destination, you know, I still have to remember that in my own healing, even though I work in mental health, like, I still struggle with anxiety, I still struggle, struggle with my ADHD, like, you know, people will see us on this side, like, we got it all together, it's like, no, child, it's two o'clock, I still forgot to take my medicine, like, we're still figuring it out, we're still doing it, and like you said, Liz, yeah, you're not alone, you're not, you know, and ther talk therapy might not be for you. You might need to do, you know, art. You might need to go dance. You might need to work out. You might, you know, therapy can be so many things and peer support can be so many things. Um, so I think it's also remembering that too, like what my therapy style might be, might not be yours. And that's okay too, you know, um, therapy can just look like so many different things for you. I couldn't have said anything else better than what Liz and Graciela said. Um, if this person is somebody that I knew, if it was somebody I didn't know, I, I agree with going to someone they trust and, and, and can confide in. Um, but if it was somebody that I do know, I will honestly tell them like, you are important to me, you know, and um, we're in this together and whatever it may look like, sometimes it isn't helping them find services. Sometimes it's just being a person to listen to it's um, an ear to listen to or um, helping. Sometimes it's, I, I like to ask the question, like, how can I support you? Just like flat out. And it could be, do you want to vent? Do you want um, advice? Do you want me to just listen and not say anything? Like really um, just be there and, and whatever that looks like for them. So I'll add that um, it, it could be so many different things like the, the team has said. 
Yes, thank you all so much. And we will wrap up there. Thank you so, so much, Liz, Graciela, Crystal, for everything that you have shared with us this last hour, your openness, your vulnerability, um, you are truly inspiring. I have learned so much from you. So many people in the chat, it looks like, are learning and connecting. And it's just been such a wonderful time together. And thank you, everyone who has been attending, who has been commenting, who has been sharing their stories. We will be in touch with everyone in the next few days with the follow-up materials. That'll include the recording to this so that you can watch and share with other people, as well as that link to request your certificate of attendance. So just thank you all and have a wonderful rest of your week. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>